Hello, Nephew community, and welcome to the Hot Topics in Nephrology podcast. I'm Jeff Lockwood with the Nephew Medical Team, here with my trusty nephrology writer and editor, Mark Newman. Every month, Mark keeps us up to date on the latest hot topics in nephrology. Well, Mark, we did it. Today is the final recording for 2023. So today, uh, Mark and I will tag team for our Nephew readers uh, some of the important events that took place this past year in kidney care. It was a big year for new drug approvals, particularly in the chronic kidney disease area, but we've also been following some of the congressional initiatives, uh, the momentum in new value-based care, and upcoming changes to how organs are procured and awaiting recipients, now close to about 80,000 people on the national waiting list for a kidney. So where do you think we should begin, Mark? Well, thanks, Jeff. I think transplant is a great place to start the uh, our last podcast for the year. Uh, transplantation, of course, is an ongoing topic um, simply because um, it's a field where there's much success. You know, um, transplant survival, graft survival, is always very good. Yet so much more could be done if we can resolve the decades-long problem of demand um, outstripping supply. Yeah, that is unusual where you have a successful solution to something like this. I mean, we know the transplants improve quality of life for patients. They save payers uh, like Medicare money. And are we making any progress? Well, there's a great deal of R&D work, research and development work uh, being done on implantable, portable, and wearable kidneys, uh, along with xenotransplantation. Um, and as we've covered this, uh, we covered this topic in the October Nephew podcast this past year. Um, and these would, in essence, sort of ease the burden of finding um, deceased and living living donors, right? I mean, if these mechanisms, these devices would work, you could, in essence, order one up, if you will, um, plan for it, have it implanted, um, have it wearable. I mean, the, the, the technology is there. But the cost for this research is steep. And device makers will tell you that every every time you discuss, you know, when is it going to come? And lots of people are interested in that question. When are we going to see these devices on the market and before the FDA? Um, device makers are still figuring out the return on investment. Um, uh, certainly, there's lots of patients out there, as we mentioned earlier, you know, 80,000 plus patients looking for a kidney transplant. Um, so, you know, until that happens, I think the focus is going to be on improving donation, and this year, particularly, so action by Congress, and even President Biden got into the um, uh, you know, sort of like the media channel, if you know, um, to help direct efforts to procure more organs. There was some publicity that he received in signing, uh, in essence, um, a bill that would allow uh, HRSA, which is the Health Services, uh, 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 the in essence, the agency that runs the transplant program uh, to step forward and start making pretty radical regulatory changes. So that includes developing these regulations, which are now underway uh, to hopefully result in some significant changes in performance standards for organ procurement organizations and also the contractor who manages them. I suspect we'll see more of that in 2024, but certainly there's a strong interest in finding out if uh, these OPOs uh, can perform better, and of course, perform better means procuring more organs and having more organs on the fritters. So we clearly need more organs to meet the demand. Until then, what else have we seen this past year that offers some optimism and changes in kidney care? So I think um, the, the key thing here is understanding that there's a lot of potential uh, for you know other things that can benefit kidney disease. You know, kidney transplants not only give patients with end-stage renal disease, a new lease on life, but also have the, have the potential to prevent patients from even going on dialysis. And that effort, a focus on treating kidney disease early, has become a more promising picture in the past year. As we mentioned, there are new drug approvals that have given nephrologists an opportunity to focus on slowing kidney disease. And the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, together with its Innovation Center, are directing the kidney care choices demonstration. And that pays nephrologists really for the first time to treat kidney disease early. 
there's an incentive for a nephrologist now to, in essence, instead of just dealing with patients who already have kidney failure, to now make an effort to slow that kidney, slow that kidney disease progression and use what in essence has been an almost a new class of drugs that are available out there to do that. And they all have, in essence, some of these drugs are multi-purpose. As, you know, for example, what they're finding out in clinical trials is that a drug that treats uh, diabetes, for example, or has other benefits, also um, other benefits such as um, uh, treating heart disease, also have benefits in terms of slowing progression of, of kidney disease. And we measure that, of course, by GFR. So the glomerular filtration rate is the, is the number or is the method that we look at to determine how well the kidneys are doing. So as that number goes down, in essence, that filtration goes down and, and patients head more towards kidney failure. If we can stabilize that GFR and or maybe increase it, that will definitely ward off uh, any more damage to the kidney and patients can um, keep those kidneys longer, keep them functioning longer. So those are the benefits we're seeing with that. And also, as we mentioned in the past, CMS is working with its innovation center and directing the kidney care choices demonstration. So that's a five-year demonstration that pays nephrologists to treat kidney disease early. Efforts are being made to educate primary care physicians, on how they can identify kidney disease early and get patients referred earlier to nephrologists. And that's a that's a key function here because many of these patients, of course, are initially treated by their primary care docs. And if primary care physicians can be more aware of the signs of kidney disease, we can get these patients to them. That's definitely something that makes me happy to hear is that there's more focus on prevention and early identification. And this effort flows nicely into the new approach to patient management, the value-based care. From what I can see, this approach and the number of payers is not going away soon. Is there a real value here for patient care? Right, Jeff. So, you know, think of value-based care as the newest insurance product, Medicare Advantage. Everybody's excited about joining a Medicare Advantage program or um uh, or signing up for a policy. The number of patients with kidney disease who have signed off from traditional Medicare and signed on from Medicare Advantage has grown significantly over the past year. One of the provisions of the 21st Century Cure Act, Cures Act, passed by Congress in 2016, was to allow patients with newly diagnosed ESRD to join these Medicare Advantage plans. So previously, if you had, uh, if you were in a Medicare Advantage plan and you kind of contracted ESRD, you would in essence be able to stay in that plan. Now the Cures Act, starting in 2021, was a lot, it now allows patients who develop ESRD and then can join those plans after that. So it in essence opened up the floodgates for the most part um, for, for d- patients with kidney failure to join these plans. Um, so I think that's a, a, a key component. It's a good comparison that, you know, it's very similar to what we're seeing in value-based care. But, you know, value-based care, it, 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 what it's, the difference I think is that this is more uh, changes for the payer side, not necessarily for the patient side. In other words, I think there's definitely some benefits, but unlike, what we're seeing with Medicare Advantage, um, CMS and Medicare are embracing it to distance themselves from the old fee-for-service payment model. And private insurers see it as a chance to identify these patients with progressive CKD sooner and avoid expensive hospitalizations and maybe even dialysis. So value-based care companies, what they do is they hire a staff that is familiar with uh, kidney patients they treat their patients more aggressively. And there's no doubt that this field of value-based care companies, as we move forward, will start to thin out. There's approximately, I would say, eight to 10 companies that are specifically dedicated to value-based care in ESRD alone. So my sense is these are going some of these companies are going to merge 
Um, and also, the hospital programs are starting to develop their own value-based care uh, expertise. So it's going to be, it's a bit of a melting pot that we're going to see over, I think, over the next 12 months. Some of those things will go away. Some of these smaller companies will join the larger companies, I believe. And we're going to see a much more, you know, refined or defined approach to this. So like most things, you know, more to come, uh, especially next year. Now, what other items are in your crystal ball, Mark? That magical well, crystal ball. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, everything, of course, has the potential to change. And uh, and a lot of that, as we know, because ESRD, ESRD program, you know, 90% of the patients that are in that program are through Medicare. And so, in essence, it's not necessarily always about good medical policy. It's really all about what the payer decides. And because this population is so tied in with Medicare, it becomes, to some degree, the potential for a political football. It depends on funding. It depends on whether um, uh, some legislative may want to revamp the Medicare program. Any of those things could potentially affect um, the program itself and how patients are cared for. But the program has been around since 1972. I don't think it's going anywhere. It's more about, I think, refinement, looking at new payment policies in the future, as we've said, and and um, and those kinds of things. So um, I think for the future, we will definitely see um, uh, we will definitely see some continued interest in expanding home dialysis. You know, the programs that CMS is pushing with its demonstrations include changes to incentives to get more patients to go home. And CMS sees that as a as a as a win-win. They believe uh, better patient care uh, patient care is better in the home than in a dialysis center. Um, patients are with their family, the quality of life is better. Um, there's more opportunities to do in essence more customized dialysis. Um, you can do short dialysis, you can do nocturnal dialysis. There's certainly a lot more options there. And and uh, and certainly we've seen the market respond to that. Um, several, um, there are now you know, almost four machines, four dialysis machines um, that are gonna be available for home hemodialysis. And of course there's PD machines on the market as well. So the equipment and the competition is there. And I think, and the government interest is there. I think overall the kidney community is there in terms of promoting this one. And of course, transplant is important too, as we discussed earlier. Uh, we definitely want to see, you know, many people feel, doctors and patients, feel that it is the best way to treat kidney disease to, in essence, get a transplant. There's there's some side effects. Of course, the immunosuppressive drugs um, that are used can be toxic and they could harm, they could harm um, other organs. But in terms of better quality of life, in terms of um, more cost control for the payers like Medicare, uh, transplant, everybody feels is the way to go. Um, you know, resolving some of the health equity issues so everybody has a level playing field and has access to home dialysis and transplant is also um, something that um, CMS and Medicare is focused on. Uh, they really want to make sure that if you're a Medicare beneficiary, you have access to both of those options. Uh, and as we as we've talked, access to care for everyone is important, especially for a federally funded program like ESRD. Lastly, I think we're going to heavily explore the role of artificial intelligence and chat. You know, uh, at the Kidney Week that we discussed last month, there were over 40, uh, 40 abstracts or posters on artificial intelligence. So it's definitely of interest to nephrologists and definitely of interest to the community at large. And the timing is right because we know that there's a shortage of nephrologists and nurses in this field. And then that means there are some gaps to fill. If a nephrologist can use, um, use AI as a complement to what they do, I think that's the key. You know, can these helpers, as we call them, provide aid without taking over the job of diagnosing and prescribing for kidney disease. And it needs to be a complementary role. And I think that's the way most of the healthcare community looks at it. 
question is how far can we take AI and um, and making sure that there's still um, a nephrologist, making sure the nephrologist, in essence, is still the captain of the ship and um, in, in control of patient care. So I think we're going to see that evolve over the next 12 months, and we'll be reporting on that in our nephew podcast in 2024. I totally agree. And I think that's a perfect way to wrap up and end the year. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us for our 2023 year in review. A ton happened this year in the world of nephrology, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what 2024 will bring. I'm thinking it's going to be another action-packed uh, year for us in nephrology, hopefully advancing kidney care even further. Uh, thank you to the nephew community for joining us and listening in. Be sure to like and subscribe to Nephew Podcasts. You can find us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation and the year of conversations. And be sure to join us in the new year. So Mark, keep us up to date on the latest hot topics in nephrology. Happy holidays, everyone. We'll see you next year. Thank you.